Hello, and welcome to a new video. Are you a fan of survival horror games? Do you find resource management in inventories incredibly fun and want to develop your own Tetris-style inventory system? Then this video is for you. I'll guide you step by step and explain the logic behind how I developed an inventory similar to the ones found in the most recent Resident Evil remakes. For that, I will be using Unity as the game engine. First, let's break down the problem. A Tetris-style inventory system consists of cells and items. Let's start with the cells. They function as elements on a grid. Since my goal is a 3D inventory, I decided to create an alternative version of one of Unity's most useful components, the grid layout component. This component dynamically arranges canvas elements by defining rows and columns. And although this component seems like the perfect solution to arrange inventory cells on a defined area, grid layout group component works with rec transform components, which are mainly used for GUI. That is why I adapted the grid layout group core behavior to work with regular transform objects. I named this class that I created Grid Transform Group, and the first thing to understand is how the grid is structured. The grid is determined by three key properties. Columns, which defines how many elements fit in a single row before wrapping to the next one. Cell size, to determine the width and height of each grid cell. And spacing, to add extra space between cells to avoid overlapping. With these three settings, we can organize objects into a structured grid that updates automatically when changes are made. The core logic of this class lives inside the Arrange Children method. It works by looping through all child objects under the grid transform group and calculating their position based on their index in the hierarchy. Now that we have a dynamic grid, it's time to focus on items. There are a few key things to consider. Not every item fits into a single cell. Some might take up two, others three, and some might even have irregular shapes. On top of that, certain items can be combined, and every item must be able to rotate. Because of this, an item can also be thought of as a smaller 3D grid. This helps associate the item's occupied space with the actual inventory grid. From now on, let's call the elements of this smaller grid items anchor points. Now. How do we actually link an item to a set of cells? This is where Unity's sphere colliders come in. By adding a small collider set as trigger to each cell and another to every anchor point of an item, we can detect when an anchor point enters a cell's area. And if an anchor point is inside a cell, that means the item that holds it is there too. Think of it like two hands grabbing each other creating a connection between the item and the inventory cell. Of course, if your inventory has hundreds of cells, which I highly doubt, this collision-based approach might not be the most efficient. Keep that in mind. Let's move on to the next topic, item combination. This works similarly to how items attach to inventory cells, but this time, if two anchor points from different items overlap, we can determine what to do with them. To handle this, I created a set of combination rules using scriptable objects. Each rule defines a base item and a secondary item, and when these elements are provided, they generate a new resulting item. The main advantage of using scriptable objects is that they allow each combination's logic to remain isolated. It's important to note that a combination can range from a simple item mix to something more complex, like a gun reload. Fundamentally the same process, but handled in a different way. Now, we need a way to interact with everything we've built. To do this, I created a custom 3D button named Transform Button, as an alternative to Unity's UI button component. The reason, we need a system that supports on-enter, on-exit, and on-pressed events in a 3D space. The main logic behind this class is this. A transform button has multiple states, normal, hovered, pressed, and disabled. Each state has a corresponding material, making it easy to provide visual feedback. When the button is in its normal state, it displays the normal material. When the mouse hovers over it, it switches to the hover material. If the player clicks, the button uses the pressed material. And finally, 
If the button is disabled, it applies the disabled material and ignores all interactions. All of this is possible using Raycast and the Unity's input system. To integrate this into a game, you can attach a transform button to any object with a collider and a mesh renderer. Then, just assign the materials for each state and hook up any desired behavior. These registered events allow us to implement drag and drop mechanics by toggling whether the item follows the mouse when on pressed occurs. Of course, this inventory system wouldn't be complete if items could not rotate. Luckily, this is one of the simplest features to implement, since items already have an internal grid transform group, rotating them is as simple as applying a fixed rotation. And because the anchor points are part of the item, they rotate along with it, keeping the system functional without any extra hassle. Once you have all these core features in place, you can start exploring advanced mechanics, like breaking cells, repairing items, or even a cell restoring system. To enhance the user experience, I added visual and audio feedback to indicate whether an action is possible or successfully completed. I also modeled a 3D briefcase to give the inventory a more polished look and stay true to the Resident Evil aesthetic. And finally, this is optional, of course, I added a simple particle system similar to the one in Resident Evil 4 Remake. Now, let's see the inventory system in action.
Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment or reach out using the contact details in the description.